Welcome. My name is James Robinson. I'm the Dean of the Divinity School, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture, including you, Kevin. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Today, I am delighted to introduce you to my colleague, my friend, Kevin Hector, who will shortly rise to the podium. Uh, Professor Hector joined our faculty in 2007, having received his PhD in systematic theology that same year from Princeton Seminary. Today's lecture marks his inaugural lecture as the Naomi Shinstone Donnelly Professor in the Divinity School and the College, a title he received in 2022 when he was thus named by the University of Chicago's Board of Trustees. Professor Hector has published three monographs, three books, including Theology Without Metaphysics, published in 2011 by Cambridge University Press, The Theological Project of Modernism, published by Oxford in 2015, and now hot off the press and benefiting yet another academic press, published by Yale in 2023, Christianity as a Way of Life, A Systematic Theology. This most recent book builds on Kevin's commitment to understanding how faith commitments and the outworking of such commitments can shed light on broader cultural issues. Surely nothing can be more relevant and timely during this moment. In addition to his three monographs, Professor Hector's work has been widely published and recognized. His work has been supported by organizations including the Templeton Foundation, the Notre Dame Center for the Philosophy of Religion, and the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. I am particularly happy to note that he is a recipient of the Award for Excellence in Graduate Teaching and Mentoring here at the University of Chicago. But perhaps his most foundational contribution of all can be traced back to his time as history teacher in the Chicago suburb of Downers Grove. After the lecture, you are all warmly invited to join us uh, for a reception on the first floor in our common room where we will have the opportunity to raise a glass of whiskey, it seems, uh, to uh, Professor Hector's accomplishment. And now please join me in welcoming Professor Kevin Hector for his lecture with a title that surely can carry more than one meaning, at least two, I know, uh, The Virtues of Theology. Hey, Thank you for that. Uh, a minor correction. The plan is um, I brought whiskey so that I could raise a glass to you all, not so as to arm you to raise a glass to me. I am grateful that you're here. I wanted to start by saying more by way of thanks for you being here and for the people who've brought me to this place, but I thought it would be better to save that for the reception. So, um, to the talk. I have little practice delivering inaugural lectures, but I gather that they differ from other academic talks in a few important respects. As far as I can tell, they tend to be more programmatic than such talks usually are, focusing on someone's research agenda rather than on a particular piece of that agenda. And they tend to say something not only about the person's own research, but about the field more generally. With that in mind, my plan for this lecture is as follows. First, I will say a few words about theology and its place at UChicago. Then, as an example of such theology, I will offer a sketch of the project I'm currently working on, which is a reinterpretation of the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. And then I will conclude with a few reflections on the field of theology more broadly. We begin then with a couple of observations about theology at UChicago, and in particular about Chicago's tradition of constructive theology. So if we consider a tradition that includes people like Paul Tillich, Ann Carr, David Tracy, Kathy Tanner, Bill Schweiker, Chris Gamwell, Dwight Hopkins, Jean-Luc Marion, Chris Culp, and Buzzy Fishbane, to name just a few, one thing we notice is that constructive theology at Chicago almost always involves serious historical work, just as historical theology here almost always involves serious constructive work. With respect to the latter, think of historical theologians like Bernie McGinn, Brian Garish, Clark Gilpin, Susan Schreiner, and Wilhelmine Otten. This is worth mentioning, I think, not least because that's not always true of constructive theology. In other contexts, a theologian might warrant their claims simply by appealing to their own experience 
or simply by pointing to a claim's moral or political implications. Not so at Chicago. If we look at this same group of thinkers, some of whom were in the room, which is not a little unnerving, a second thing we notice is that constructive theology here is a kind of contextual theology, by which I mean that its insights are self-consciously shaped by some of the material and especially cultural conditions within which it operates, particularly the conditions involved in doing theology within a secular university like this one. If so, then if we want to understand Chicago's tradition of theology, we need to understand these conditions. One helpful way of doing so, it seems to me, is to think of the university as a particular sort of conversation and of theology here as part of that conversation. There are many different kinds of conversation, of course, each of which operates according to certain norms and which prizes certain kinds of contribution. Just think of the difference between what one is doing if one is catching up or reminiscing, gossiping, bad-mouthing, flirting, debating, BSing, one-upping, or engaging in witty repartee. These are all different conversation games, as it were, and one plays these games by operating according to their rules and striving to make good moves and avoid bad ones by their lights. If you don't believe that these are different games, think about what happens if someone responds to small talk or flirting as if it were a debate. My suggestion is that we can think of this university, too, as a, ki a particular kind of extended conversation, one that operates according to certain norms and that prizes certain kinds of contribution. Hence, if we want to understand what it would mean for theology to try to be part of this conversation and how it would thus be shaped by it, we need to clarify what this conversation's norms are and what sort of contributions it values. To say everything at once, I would characterize the university's shared conversation as a disciplined pursuit of epistemic goods such as knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. To say that it is a disciplined pursuit is a way of pointing toward the norms of, uh, by, to the norms by which this conversation is governed, norms according to which participants are supposed to clarify and hold steady the meaning of load-bearing terms, delimit the scope of their claims, provide sufficient warrant for those claims, make the steps of their arguments explicit, address warranted objections, and so forth. A principal reason why participants play by these rules in turn is that it helps make the pursuit of epistemic goods a shared enterprise. Such rules maximize the likelihood that these goods are recognizable as such to others in the conversation, understandable to them, accountable to them, and hopefully illuminating to them. If theology wants to be part of this conversation, then, it is going to have to play by these rules, and that is one of the things we see when we consider the theologians I mentioned at the outset. Again, though, we're not just talking about a disciplined conversation. It is a disciplined pursuit of epistemic goods, which is to say that what this conversation values, and what its participants thus aim at, is goods like truth, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. I want to suggest, moreover, that it aims especially at the last two, understanding and wisdom, though here I can off offer only a light defense of that idea. But to see why I would hold this view, notice first that a person can hold true beliefs by accident, as when someone makes a lucky guess or when an unreliable source happens to get something right. Hence, although participants in this conversation do want to hold true beliefs, this point should help us see that we want something more than that. We want true beliefs that we arrived at on the basis of a reliable belief-forming mechanism, and so beliefs we know to be true. We're not just in the true beliefs business, in other words, but in the knowing when a belief is true business. Crucially, though, we want something more than this, too. Since we could know that a belief is true, yet have very little understanding of it, as when someone knows something solely on the basis of an expert's sincerely expressed assertions. To see what I mean, imagine that I believe a football announcer's statement to the effect that an apparent sack didn't count because of the tuck rule, but that when pressed, the only thing I can say about this rule is that it is a rule. In that case, I may count as knowing that that's why the sack didn't count, but I would not be able to make such much sense out of that belief or see how it fits with other beliefs. Hence, just as we are not only in the true beliefs business, 
I would likewise say that we are not only in the no when a belief is true business. We are also in the business of understanding what beliefs mean, why someone would hold them, what they imply, and so on. Very roughly, then, this is what I have in mind when I say that our shared conversation aims not merely at truth nor merely at knowledge, but at understanding these things and using them to understand other things. If I'm right about this, then it would give us an idea of what it would look like if theology were to be a participant in this conversation. Roughly, it would mean that theology would use religions' representations of themselves to make sense of those religions, just as it would try to understand those representations themselves. This is one of the things that theology has long done under the rubric of faith-seeking understanding, and it is something that theologians here have done by trying to shed light on these representations, and in particular, doing so in such a way that they would be intelligible to our colleagues and indeed to ourselves. Again then, understanding is one of the principal goods at which this conversation aims, but it is not its highest good. For there is an epistemic good more estimable than understanding, namely wisdom. To be wise, on my view, is not only to hold beliefs that one well understands and knows to be true, but to use all of this to become a reliable judge of truth and falsehood, even or especially in the face of potentially misleading factors such as bias, illusion, small sample size, and common sense. In a word, we might call this sort of wisdom discernment. It is the sort of wisdom that is counseled when we advise people not to judge a book by its cover or not to believe everything they hear, but it obviously involves much more than trustworthy sayings. To be a discerning person, one must have a broad array of true beliefs, a good grip on their respective credentials, and a lively sense of how they relate to one another and to other candidate beliefs. Just as one must have the intellectual tools and dispositions necessary to put these to good use in daily life. Wisdom isn't only a matter of judging truth and falsehood, however. It's also a matter of knowing how to conduct oneself well in a wide variety of circumstances. We might call such wisdom prudence or know-how, and it's the sort of practical wisdom on offer when we tell people to think before they speak, to treat others the way they would want to be treated, and to measure twice before cutting. On the one hand, there are skill-based varieties of such wisdom, of the sort involved in knowing how to teach, perform brain surgery, or design a building so that it will not collapse during an earthquake. On the other hand, and more importantly for our purposes, there is the practical wisdom involved in and necessary to living a good life, knowing how to respond appropriately to injustice, to tragedy, and to our own shortcomings, for instance, as well as to blessings and success and our own rectitude, knowing how to distinguish what is important from what is not so that we won't get caught up in trivial matters, knowing what temptations we are liable to and how to handle them, and so on. In short, this is the sort of practical wisdom involved in having a vision of the good life and knowing how to orient ourselves toward that vision in the midst of various life circumstances. As this formulation should make clear, discernment is an important ingredient in a good life, just as a reliable sense of the good is an important ingredient in discernment. Absent the former, someone would not have a reliable read of their situation, and so of what that situation requires, whereas absent the latter, someone would not have a reliable sense of how to use their discernment in pursuit of something worthwhile. Wisdom thus consists in a joining together of discernment and practical wisdom, and I would argue that this is the highest epistemic good and the highest good of this university. As our motto puts it, Prescott scientia vita excolatur, may knowledge increase so that life may be enriched. Unsurprisingly, theology here aims to contribute something to the pursuit of this epistemic good, too, for it not only tries to understand religious traditions, but looks to them as a source of would-be wisdom. Wisdom about what it means to be human, or how to deal with our vulnerability, or how we can string together and so fashion a life out of glimpses of the transcendent, or how practices of prayer and lament and vocation and forgiveness and looking for the image of God in others can help us lead better lives. I could cite countless examples, but the point is that theology here tries to shed light on issues of larger human moment, as Kathy Tanner memorably put it to me during my interview here at Piccolomundo. Putting everything together, then, 
When I say that theology at Chicago is a kind of contextual theology, this is what I have in mind. It is self-consciously shaped by some of the cultural conditions in which it operates, particularly the norms and values implicit in the shared conversation in which this university lives and moves and has its being. This explains why theology here has almost always taken the form of correlation, as Tillich put it, since it is always trying to learn from, hold itself accountable to, and contribute something to this conversation. I'll say more about why this tradition matters and why it matters to me in the third section of this talk. Before turning to this, I want to illustrate some of these ideas by saying a few words about the project I'm currently working on, tentatively entitled The Virtues of a Life Well-Led, Rethinking Faith, Hope, and Love. To explain what I have in mind, we can begin with the notion of virtue, which I understand as a quality or trait that makes something good at or for some purpose. A novel's virtues might thus include interesting, well-developed characters and a plot whose unfolding is earned yet not entirely predictable, just as a bread knife's virtues might include its serrations, its shape, and its sharpness. We could multiply examples, but the point is simply that a virtue in the broadest sense refers to a quality that makes something good at what it is for. Note well, though, that as I use the term, certain traits can count as virtues simply because they make something good at being the kind of thing it is. Whatever else you think of them, we might regard breed standards as an attempt to identify what would make a particular dog a good instance of its kind, and so as attempting to enumerate such virtues. When I say that virtues are traits that make something good at or for some purpose accordingly, that should not be taken to mean that the purpose must be something other than being a good instance of the sort of thing that something is. By the same token, the mere fact that something has traits that make it good for some purpose would not by itself qualify those traits as virtues, for the simple reason that its goodness for that purpose must not be accidentally related to the kind of thing it is. In a pinch, I could tie bedsheets together in order to lower myself from a window, but the qualities that make bedsheets useful for this purpose are only accidentally related to the qualities that would make them good sheets, from which it follows that what makes them good for this purpose does not thereby qualify as sheetly virtues. Qualifications aside, my point is that virtues are the traits or qualities that make something good at whatever they are supposed to be good for. Needless to say, humans can be good at all sorts of things. Think, for instance, of especially skillful musicians or carpenters or parents. When they have cultivated such a high degree of aptitude for doing certain things that they can reliably do them with excellence, we rightly call them virtuosos, since they embody the very qualities or traits that make someone good at these things. Humans can also be morally good which brings us to the territory of what many would consider virtue properly so-called. We thereby also move bless you, from things that have virtues and virtuosos to the territory of virtuous persons, just as we move into the territory where it first makes sense to talk about vice as that which contrasts with virtues. A dull bread knife may be shoddy or substandard, but it is not vicious. Likewise, a clumsy dancer or a boring conversationalist. Not so with a person who falls short of moral standards. Broadly speaking, a bit too broadly, but bear with me, moral virtues are traits that make someone good at doing the right thing in the right way at the right time and for the right reasons. An honest person thus not only has a settled disposition to tell the truth, but they are so disposed because they think truth-telling is important, since that is something we owe to one another, say. Likewise, the compassionate person not only has a settled disposition to feel sympathy for those who are going through hard times, but their sympathy is rooted in and expressive of a respect for the other person's dignity. Virtues like these thus make people good at something especially important, namely being good to others. Obviously, then, moral virtues are a crucial part of living a good life, but they are not the only virtues that help people do so. We might also think of qualities like toughness or resoluteness, for instance, that help people handle misfortune without being crushed by it. The qualities of curiosity and fair-mindedness that help people make sense of themselves and their circumstances. And the quality of practical wisdom that helps people respond well to a wide variety of situations. 
These are not moral virtues, it seems to me, or at least not necessarily, but they are nevertheless virtues that help people live their lives well. That brings me to my project's central claim, which is that we can usefully think of faith, hope, and love as a special class of such virtues. They are virtues that make people good at orienting their lives towards something bigger, and just so, they can help people lead their lives well. Needless to say, every element of this claim requires elaboration and defense, and also needless to say, I cannot do justice to any of it within the time I have remaining. For present purposes, then, a handful of promissory notes will have to suffice, though obviously I hope to provide the requisite funds in the published version. We begin, then, by considering two components of a life well-led. It's not easy to generalize about what it would mean to lead such a life, of course, much less defend exceptionless claims about it, so I won't be doing that here. Instead, think of my claims about these components as conditional. If one counts these as components of a life well-led, then these virtues would help one lead one's life well. With that in mind, consider that one of the things many people want is to make something out of their lives, or in some, to lead a life that matters. To be sure, there's an objective sense in which every life matters, precisely because every life has an inherent and inviolable worth. But there's also a kind of mattering that is a product of the way one leads one's life, and what one makes of it. This is what people have in mind when they worry whether they are spending too much time on things that are unimportant, or if their life as a whole doesn't add up to much. What would it take, then, to lead a life that matters? One obvious condition is that one's life must be guided by a sense of purpose or goal-orientedness. For absent this, one would be more or less wandering through one's life rather than leading it. Such goals can come in the form of an overarching purpose, according to which one experiences one's life as a kind of singular project, but they can also come in the form of daily or even hourly to-do lists. A bit crassly, if we think of a life as having the potential for one million dollars worth of purposefulness, we can say that some people try to spend the entire million on one thing, whereas others spend it a quarter at a time. Either way, such purposefulness is a necessary but not sufficient condition for leading a life that matters, for the obvious reason that one's life may be directed toward a purpose even if that purpose is not one's own. After all, someone who is constantly being told what to do will always be acting purposefully, but they would not thereby count as leading their lives. For a purpose to contribute to the leading of one's life accordingly, it must be one's own purpose. So what makes a purpose count as such? We might be tempted to answer in terms of choice, so it's worth pointing out that choosing a purpose is neither necessary nor sufficient for it to count as one's own. Since I can totally buy into a purpose that has been set for me by someone else, as when I gladly do all the readings for a required class, just as I can set a purpose for myself that I end up feeling stuck with, as when I regret the fact that I chose a major solely out of spite. As these examples suggest, what matters here isn't whether I chose the purpose, but whether it's a purpose that I am invested in. For if I am invested in it, if it matters to me, then in orienting my life toward this purpose, I am simultaneously leading my life. So far, so good. But the mere fact that a person orients their life toward a purpose that matters to them would not entail that their life actually matters, nor that they would experience it as such. It's not hard to imagine someone becoming completely obsessed with a video game or a TV show, for instance, and thus devoting all of their time to it, and yet simultaneously feeling like this was a waste of their time, like they were throwing their lives away. To be sure, it's not just video games and TV shows that can leave one feeling this way. To take just one more example, we see the same sort of problem closing in on Tolstoy. Despite having generational wealth, a happy family, and being the most celebrated writer alive, he came to wonder whether any of the things that mattered to him truly mattered. So Tolstoy writes, I would say to myself, well, fine, so you'll be more famous than Google, Pushkin, Shakespeare, Moliere, more famous than all the writers in the world. So what? And I had absolutely no answer, he says. <laughs> 
the mere fact that Tolstoy's life was occupied with things that mattered to him was not sufficient for him to feel like his life actually mattered. For that, he needed to feel like those things mattered not only to him, but in their own right. It's difficult to specify what makes something matter in its own right, or what enables a person to experience them as such, but it seems fair to say that in general, people feel like this condition is met when their lives contribute to the achievement of some significant good. Following popular usage, I refer to such significant goods as something bigger, though this phrase is misleading if it is taken to mean bigger than the person themselves, since we shouldn't rule out the possibility that someone might orient their lives towards something bigger precisely by cultivating character goods, for instance. Qualifications aside, many people's sense of something bigger is informed by and often identified with religion, which is something that Tolstoy himself made much of and a point to which we will return. This way of thinking about leading a life already helps us see some of the goods as well as some of the bads that we open ourselves up to if we try to lead a life that matters. On the one hand, we open up the possibility of leading lives that we would find satisfying and important and that would increase the sum total of goodness in the world. But on the other hand, we also expose ourselves to the possibility that we will experience our lives and indeed experience ourselves as a failure and we simultaneously raise the stakes considerably on what we are doing with our time. Then again, we open ourselves up to some of these same risks simply insofar as there are things that matter to us, irrespective of whether we want our lives themselves to matter. That brings us to a second key component of leading a life, namely that people generally want to navigate their circumstances in a way that befits the things that matter to them. To be sure, we usually do this without a second thought. We follow routines that help us navigate everyday life, and if everything stays more or less on script as it usually does, then we may not even realize that we're navigating anything. But sometimes we face circumstances that are harder to deal with, and in those moments, leading a life requires something more than our routines have to offer. People don't usually have a routine on hand, after all, for the moment when a relationship falls apart, or when they've totally blown it, or when they get a serious illness, or when they lose their job, or when something bad happens to someone they love, or when things that matter to them are out of their control. Leading a life in such circumstances requires people to figure out how to navigate such circumstances, and how to do so in such a way that they remain true to the things that matter to them. Here again, people often turn to religion for help, though often enough they find that religion has to be reinterpreted in order to do the job. After all, religion, too, may be something that people have to figure out how to navigate. If we had time, it would be helpful at this point to consider several recent memoirs, since this is exactly what we see in Christian Wyman's and Kate Bowler's memoirs about coming to terms with their respective cancer diagnoses, in Charles Marsh dealing with anxiety attacks, and Natalie Carnes trying to reconcile herself to her daughter's growing independence from her, in Dante Stewart's figuring out how to respond to white supremacy within his church, and in countless other memoirs. In each case, people turn to religion to help them navigate difficult circumstances, but in each case, they have to reinterpret religion before it can do the trick. Time is short, unfortunately, so this will have to be a story for another day. For now, we need to turn to the last part of my claim, namely that faith, hope, and love are virtues that orient people toward something bigger, and just so are virtues that can help them lead their lives well. In what follows, I'll draw on one community's collective memories and traditions, those of Christianity, to provide a clearer understanding of what this might look like. To be very clear, though, my aim here is not apologetic. I'm not trying to suggest that if people want to lead their lives well, they should become Christians. I'm suggesting, rather, that if we want to get a grip on these virtues and their place in a life well-led, it makes sense to consider a tradition that has long reflected on them and sought to put them into practice. Hence, even if people have no interest in orienting themselves toward God or undertaking such practices, these examples should give them a clearer understanding of what these virtues are and the role they can play in a person's life. Onward then to faith. In ordinary usage, faith sometimes refers to the belief that something is true, especially when one does not know whether it is true but wants it to be. 
It can also refer to believing someone and so taking their word for something. But we come closer to its meaning as a virtue when we think of believing in something. Belief in democracy, say, or belief in one's marriage, or a teacher's belief in one of their students. In cases like these, faith is a matter of believing that something holds a certain promise, and thus a belief to the effect that something's goodness will prevail, or that its goodness would prevail if given the chance. Insofar as one is invested in such a belief, one may likewise keep faith with it. In that case, faith refers to loyalty or faithfulness of a sort that entails that one's belief in something can itself be believed in. Putting these two things together, we can think of the virtue of faith as a matter of having faith in something and keeping faith with it to such an extent and in such a way that this faith gives shape to one's life. To see how this virtue can direct one towards something bigger, and so how it might help people lead their lives, it's helpful to consider what it would mean to have faith in God. Within the Christian tradition, it's customary to explain faith's beginnings in terms of believing God, that is, of taking God's word for something, and in particular, of believing God's promises. To believe God's promises, in turn, is already to believe in God, not only in the sense of believing that God exists, but in the more robust sense, just noted, of believing that God's promises will be fulfilled, and so that God's goodness will prevail. What is more, the promise that one believes is a kind of life-changing news. This is what gospel means. In the sense that if it is true, it changes everything. If one believes this promise, then one should bring one's life into line with it. Believing this promise should thus lead one to keep faith with it, and Christianity offers a handful of practices designed to help one do just that. Renunciative practices, for instance, that help people break the grip of competing orientations. Think of fasting, almsgiving, and Sabbath-keeping. Narrative practices that help people see themselves and the world in light of this belief. Think of sermons, testimonies, and the admiration of exemplars. And liturgical practices that imprint something bigger on the passage of time. Think of liturgical seasons, holy days, and rituals like baptisms, funerals, and weddings that inscribe important life moments in faith's meaning framework. Such practices are meant to orient a person's life toward and help them see their lives in light of something bigger, namely their belief in and faithfulness to a transcendent good. So far, so good, but taken by itself, belief in something bigger, and particularly belief in a transcendent good, can make people's ordinary lives seem small or even trivial, and therefore like they don't matter. That brings us to a second virtue, love, that helps us see how ordinary life itself can be part of something bigger. At a minimum, to love something is to value its goodness, where this means that one takes pleasure in that goodness or otherwise appreciates it for its own sake, and that one's valuing of it is fairly durable. This is the sort of love that people usually have in mind when they talk about loving coffee or books or country music. Such love becomes deeper and more resilient when one values something in such a way that its goodness becomes one's own good, in the sense that one takes pleasure in what is good for it and not only in one's enjoyment of that goodness, that one therefore wants to see it flourish and so that one has reason to do things to ensure that it does. Sometimes this also means wanting that goodness reflected in one's own life, particularly when one values the goods embodied in someone's character. This is part of what it can look like to want these sorts of goods to flourish, namely that one wants to see them replicated in others, including oneself. One may thus want to reflect the courage or compassion one sees in another's life, just as one may want to value what they value and take as good what they take as good. This account of love helps us understand how ordinary life could be included in something bigger, and so how it could be experienced as mattering. To see how this would work, consider a person who loves God's goodness and who takes that goodness as their own good. If so, the person would want that good to flourish in the world, would want it to be reflected in their own life, and would want to love what God loves. If God loves the good of everything that exists, then in taking God's goodness as their own good, the person would likewise want to love the good of everything that exists. It would also follow that, in mirroring God's love for something, one is loving God. 
in the same way that someone who cares for my dog while I'm out of town shows care for me. One's love for earthly things can thereby be included in one's orientation toward God, and it can also play a part in making the world a reflection of God's love. One's everyday love for these things can thus be part of something bigger. Humans cannot love the good of everything the way God does, of course. They can reflect God's love only in a finite way, which is one reason why vocation is a vital aspect of love for God. To love God is to love the particular goods that God has called one to care for, and just so, to experience one's life as part of something bigger precisely within these limits. To cultivate this love, in turn, we need practices that teach people to perceive and appreciate more and more of the goodness all around them. For example, practices of seeing the image of God in others, of putting oneself in their shoes, of compassion and empathy, and of spending unhurried time with them. And we need practices of acting on behalf of that good. For example, hospitality, service, forgiveness, and the like. These practices train one to become an ally of other things' goodness, just as they train one to make more and more of one's life a reflection of God's love, and so a reflection of something bigger. No matter how loving a person becomes, however, their circumstances, and they themselves, will often fail to reflect the something bigger to which they are committed. They may thus be tempted to give up on it, either because they feel defeated by these failures or because they get so used to them, though to the way things are, that they no longer set their hearts on something beyond them. To address these issues, we turn to the third of our virtues, namely hope. On one standard analysis, hope is construed as a desire that things would turn out a certain way, along with the belief that they could, in fact, turn out this way. This makes sense as far as it goes. For absent desire, one's belief that something is possible could equally be a source of dread or simply food for thought, whereas absent belief that something is possible, one's desire for it would be mere fantasizing or wishful thinking. Yet something is missing from this analysis, as evidenced by the fact that someone could want something to happen, believe that it could happen, and yet despair rather than hope. After all, it makes perfect sense for someone to say, I really want this job and actually think I'm a good fit for it, but I know I won't get it. In addition to desire for something and belief in its possibility accordingly, hope also requires that one hold a favorable attitude toward this possibility, of such a sort that one would feel justified in making plans on its basis, for instance, or letting it figure in one's vision of the future. This is what hopefulness looks like when it's tethered to concrete hopes. Yet one can also remain hopeful even in the absence of concrete hopes, as when one continues to believe that things will turn out okay somehow, even when one's circumstances suggest otherwise. This is what it means, I take it, when people talk about hope against hope. And such hopes are often, though not necessarily, tied to belief in some sort of a transcendent power or goodness. However that may be, notice that the virtue of hope is a matter of maintaining such hopefulness, irrespective of whether this is bound to any concrete hopes. And notice, too, that a person can intend to bring something about only if they can reasonably hope that it's not impossible, which has obvious implications for hope's place in leading a life. And here I'm waving a hand at Kant. We can get a better grip on these ideas by considering what it looks like to hope in God. On a Christian account, to hope in God means, first of all, that one believes that God will fulfill all of God's promises and that one desires this fulfillment, indeed that one's heart is set on. The content of this hope, in turn, is a state of affairs in which every sort of goodness flourishes and so in which every desire is ultimately fulfilled, albeit not necessarily in the way one would expect. With this hope in view, one can believe that all of one's desires are included in and point toward something bigger. Needless to say, this hope should lead one to see all desires this way, not just one's own, and should thus enable one to share others' hopes, to experience a deeper kind of unity with them, and even to find new grounds for undertaking collective action with them. What is more, because one's hopes are in God, one can sustain them even when there is no earthly reason to do so. For even when ordinary possibilities seem to have run out, 
one can still hope in a transcendent possibility and can thus hope against hope. Then again, sometimes what people need is to remain hopeful even in the absence of concrete hopes, as when a person with a chronic medical condition can come to terms with that condition only after they stop hoping for healing. In cases like these, it is important that the person be able to relinquish such hopes without thereby being defeated which is one reason why it's important that hopefulness can be directed toward a future that transcends all present possibilities. Either way, putting one's hope in God can enable one to remain hopeful even in the bleakest of circumstances, which means in turn that one can continue to orient one's life towards something bigger even when one's circumstances seem like a dead end. That brings us to a few practices that can help people sustain such hope. Practices of prayer, for instance, in which one turns to God for the fulfillment of one's desires, and which thus help one maintain one's hope in that fulfillment. Along with practices of protest, in which one resists the status quo and thus keeps oneself and others open to the future. A third set of practices, which we might call foretaste offering practices. That's not catchy. I'm working on it. Foretaste offering practices, for now, aim to create or at least help people get better at spotting glimpses of a hoped-for future. Examples here include the celebration of worship and the Eucharist, creating and responding to social openings, and doing the sort of imaginative, creative work that we associate with art as well as play. Practices like these are designed to sustain one's belief in a fulfillment that goes beyond present possibilities, to keep one's heart set on that fulfillment, and to enable one to live in light of it even now. Putting everything together, then, we can see how faith, love, and hope might work together to help people orient their lives towards something bigger, and just so to experience their lives as mattering, just as they can help people navigate difficult circumstances in ways that befit what matters to them. By making people good at orienting their lives to something bigger accordingly, they likewise help them to lead their lives well, or so I claim. That, in a nutshell, is the project that I'm working on right now. Hopefully, this rough sketch gives you a better sense of what I had in mind at the outset when I talked about Chicago's theological tradition. There's much more to say about all of this, but I want to conclude by offering a few thoughts about why this sort of theology might have something to contribute not just to Chicago, but to the larger field of theology. Time is short, so I will mention only two. On the one hand, theology is losing more and more of its institutional homes, particularly seminaries, and we cannot afford to lose universities, too. We need ways of practicing theology accordingly that university administrators and provostial committees can recognize as the sort of thing that belongs in their institution, and that's something that Chicago's tradition is especially well-suited to provide. On the other hand, I want to suggest that this tradition has something important to offer theology itself. Very roughly, I would say that the field today is largely dominated by two approaches, a broadly inward-looking approach, which we might call doctrinal theology, and a broadly outward-looking one that we might call activistic theology. I think both approaches would benefit from being a part of the, a conversation of the sort that I've been talking about. So briefly, doctrinal theology tends to make sense of religious representations primarily and sometimes exclusively by relating them to other such representations. There is a lot of very careful, very good work being done on this front and much that I genuinely admire. But I nevertheless think it would be helpful if such theology were part of a larger conversation, not least because this would help us make sure we actually understand what we're saying and that regular people do too. Some of you have already heard this story, but one of the turning points in my intellectual development occurred when, in my first year of graduate school, a mentor pressed me to explain what I meant when I claimed that the Holy Spirit elevated our actions to God so that they really participate, and here I italicized the word really, they really participate in the divine life and therefore are perfected by grace. I was very impressed by this claim. When pressed, it turned out that I had no idea what this claim actually meant, and thus that I had only apparently shed light on my subject matter. That conversation thus helped me distinguish between understanding my subject matter and merely appearing to understand it, 
just as it pushed me to make my would-be understandings more explicit and so more easily judgeable to my conversation partner and to me. In turn, it also made it easier for both of us to see what light my conversation partner could shed on the thing that we were talking about. It seems to me, then, that being part of a larger conversation can do something good for doctrinal theology. That brings me to the other dominant approach, which I have called activistic theology. This sort of theology does the important work of seeing how theology could be on the side of justice and of correcting theology when it isn't. Here, too, there is much good work being done and much that I admire. Such work is usually part of a converse larger conversation, too, which, again, I appreciate. But my worry here is that activistic theology doesn't always act like a full-fledged partner in this conversation, and that too often, therefore, the conversation becomes a one-way street. Justice discourse is supposed to have something to say to theology, but theology is not supposed to have anything to say to justice discourse. To be clear, there are moments in any conversation where the appropriate thing to do is simply listen. But if one, if, but if one participant in a conversation is only listening, or only allowed to contribute when they agree with what their conversation partner is saying, then it's not much of a conversation. My point here, then, is simply that activistic theology might benefit from thinking of itself as, and striving to be, a full participant in these larger conversations, not least because theology may actually have something to contribute to them. It seems to me, therefore, that Chicago's tradition of theology has something to contribute not only to this university, but to the larger field. No wonder, then, why this tradition matters to me, and indeed why I think it matters in its own right. In light of all I have said thus far, it should be clear what this implies for the life that I'm trying to lead. Let me close, then, simply by saying that I hope this tradition matters enough to Chicago that we continue to carry it on, since I think it would be a great loss if we didn't. Thank you. All right, I'm happy to continue the conversation. Can I ask you, in, in response to the definitional work that you were doing that I appreciate very much, uh, to ask you about some of the sources and content of the theology you were referring to. For example, twice in the talk, I think you referred to seeing the image of God in others. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, how does one determine on the model that you're describing what the image of God is? Yeah, good. That's great. I So the question, I hope you all heard it, but the question is like, how do, for instance, this is just a case in point, right? But how do I determine what I understand the image of God to be, right? This is obviously contested. Professor Stackert, if you don't know, is one of the leading scholars of the Pentateuch, right? So he has a, a good grip on the biblical materials as well as the debates about this. Um, so I, uh, the methodology I've defended on this is um, I, I'm largely looking at the tradition as a whole and doing a kind of conceptual give and take with the tradition. Um, so I, I'm trying very hard to let the tradition push back on me, but also make some sense of the tradition as best I can. And so um, it's not just a matter to come maybe right to the point of uh, trying to do biblical exegesis, which I'm really not qualified to do, but there's a lot of history, history of biblical exegesis that I'm trying to weed through. And one of the desiderata of weeding through it is trying to think about what seems to be doing justice to the biblical text, but it has a life of its own within the Christian tradition, right? And so there are, as you surely know, there are a few different uh, streams of this, uh, what the image of God means, whether it's a, a kind of uh, representative in a political sense, or whether it's a kind of reflection of God, or whether it's relationality, right? Or whether there's, right, there's, there's different versions of this. Um, and truthfully, I, I try to make sense of all of them um, and draw on them, and I'm making some adjudications, but it's, it's, it's working with the tradition. Um, so I, I, if, if you wanted, I'm, I'd be happy to cite the actual sources, but that's broadly, that's the methodology, working with sources within the tradition in such a way that, I mean, the, the standard I hold myself to is 
trying to make sense of Christianity, significant aspects of Christianity in such a way that um, people could see that as, yes, this represents what I understand Christianity to be. That's a, it's a tough standard. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Levin. I think this is really marvelous. Uh, pulling together of, of both the moral and theological uh, sides of, of uh, our ideas of virtue. Uh, <clears throat> I want to push you on just one point, though, which is the parts of theology that uh, suggest that, that the truth that we're looking for transcends our conceptual abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, people at the University of Chicago are very hesitant to suggest that there may be limits to their conceptual abilities, but uh, I, I, I think uh, that the, there are theological traditions that, that do that and make it an essential part of their understanding of what theological affirmations are. Uh, so, so I I want I want to understand how your something more uh, can encompass those kinds of theological claims as well, and and then the harder question, of course, is how are you going to make sense of those to your uh, uh, rational but secular dialogue partners? Mm -hmm. That's great. I I hope you all heard the question. So the question is about. Um, Right, so I, I've talked about prizing understanding, right, a lot in, in such a way that it might seem like I'm there. There's a whiff of reductiveness to it, right? Um, if we're, if is there a danger at least of reducing transcendence to what we can understand? That's that's surely an important concern. Um, in response to that, I would say um, my my. First response is to say that there's a difference between the reductive approach um, and trying to understand things, and the reductive approach is an example of doing it wrong, right? So if if my would-be understanding of Christianity or any religion ends up being reductive, that's going to be at odds with the religion and ipso facto probably not a, a good understanding of it. Um, there is surely a danger of that, though, that I'm, I think that's something that I should be mindful of, right? It's something like an occupational hazard of somebody who tries to do theology the way that I do. Um, but this is also a reason why it's important to me that I let sources push back. Um, and that includes mystics, uh, right? Mystical theology strikes me as really important. And part of the conversation includes people on the theology side who see things differently than I do, uh, and who therefore push me to think um, against the the kind of mania for precision that I might otherwise be aiming for, uh, and the ways in which um, the ungraspable can itself be an important um, consideration in doing theology. But even that... Right, I, I, I'd say even that is something that we can try to make some sense of, right? Not all ungraspableness is the same, right? So we can make sense of these different kinds of ungraspableness. Um, and we can also make sense of the kind of preparation, the, the kind of practical life that goes into mystical experience. Um, we can make sense of that to some extent. Um, I think, if anything, and people would still maybe disagree with me on this. I worry about reaching for mystery or the ungraspable, how do I say this, too soon. Uh, as if it's a would-be explanation, which it's not, or as if, I mean, it, it can short-circuit the attempt to understand things, right? And so if we too quickly say, um, ah, yes, well, that's mystery. But it's God, so what would we expect? Well, I mean, that's sort of true, but nevertheless, if if I just stop there, then I'm definitely not going to proceed to any 
depth of understanding. And so I, there's a, a kind of give and take there. That's a great question though. And it's, it, you put your finger right on something that, um, yeah, I think this is a lifelong concern for me, given the kind of work I try to be doing. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful lecture, Professor Hector. I wanted to ask you perhaps two interrelated questions that come out of the history of theology, just so that I can understand your position better, and also arguments that have run against some problems in our context. The first is the so-called unity of the virtues. Mm -hmm which claims that if you have one of the virtues, you will have them all. That seems to run headlong into our actual experience of human life. So I'd be interested to know how you understand the interrelation of the virtues, faith, hope, and love, in terms of this question of yep. the unity of yep. virtue. Can you be faithful but not hopeful? Can you be loving but not faithful or hopeful? The second one is, is that the Christian tradition is usually, or much of the Christian tradition, has identified faith, hope, and love with theological virtues, yeah. which is to say that they have to be instilled in the individual. Maybe this is back to your first question in graduate school about the Spirit. That <laughs> they have to be instilled in the believer. They're not simply the product of practices, even religious practices and cult in the church. So how do you think about the divine activity within these these three crucial virtues? Thanks. Those are both great questions. Thank you. Uh, with respect to the unity of virtues, by the way, that's uh, you should know that's Professor Schweiker, one of the people I I cite as an exemplar of the Chicago Church. Um, with respect to the unity of virtues, I think at a conceptual level, there is a unity of the theological virtues. In real life, there is struggle, right? There is there can be a dark night of the soul, where or there can be, um, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, right? And so it's it's clearly the case that the conceptual work bumps up against real life. And that's part of the reason why I've become so interested in memoirs because um, holding these kinds of claims accountable to uh, the way people are struggling to reconcile themselves to their experiences and struggling to find a way forward when there seems to be no way, that strikes me as really important, something that I want to be able to get some kind of grip on um, and just be held accountable. So I, again, I think conceptually, I think there is a unity of the virtues, but we should never think that we can move from concepts to life. Um, secondly, with respect to theological virtues and whether whether so theological virtues means two things generally, right? Um, on the one hand, it means they are directed toward God. On the other hand, that they are um, infused by God. Um, I certainly am telling a story according to which these could be directed toward God. Uh, the question is whether they are necessarily infused by God on this account. I don't give any details of that here, right? Um, Generally, I would want to give some account according to which um, there is grace perfecting nature. So I think there are natural analogs to each of these things. When Thomas talks about hope, for instance, he starts off by talking about the natural, uh, he, he's, he's hesitant to call it a virtue, right? But um, this irascible trait of hope, there is a natural version of it. And then we see the theological version of it. And he sometimes then wants to say that there's more discontinuity between these things. And I'm leaning more toward continuity because I think we just get a clearer grip on these things uh, if we start off by trying to make sense of how theological faith is related to faith in democracy or in my student or whatever. Um, but I would also say that that doesn't preclude giving an account of how God would be at work in 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 shaping these virtues within us, God's spirit. I mean, this is the kind of account that I have given. I don't, I'm not generally willing to choose between um, our being shaped by God and our being shaped by social practices, for instance. Um, and so that's generally the kind of tack I've taken, and that's the tack I would take here. I have to first concede that I come from a non-theological background, um, so it very well may be the case that the confusion stemming or leading to this question is just from a place of ignorance. Um, 
Uh, but I'm curious, you, you made the claim dur during um, you were speaking about so, uh, something along the lines of ha ha having an ultimate purpose in life is, is, is a necessary condition for um, a life um, which is good and virtuous or something along these lines. Um, correct me if that's a, a... I'm happy to correct you, but I want to see where you're going. Um, I, I guess I'm... I'm that, that's a non-obvious necessary condition. Uh, it, it seems to me that the life of something like an existential nihilist can still be good and um, um, perhaps purposeful is defini uh, definitionally the, the wrong word, but, but, but good and, and virtuous, um, despite their um, lack of belief in this, this purpose generally. Yeah, no, this is, I'm happy, I'm grateful to be able to clarify this because I am not saying, and I tried, I tried to make sure I wasn't saying, um, that these are the only kinds of lives that are good, um, or the only kinds of lives that could be virtuous. What I said was, um, for a life to matter, if that's a desideratum, right? Like, people might not want to aim to make their life matter, and maybe that's a wise choice. But if people do, what I suggested was they would need to have, um, their lives would need to be purposeful. The purpose would need to matter to them, and they would need to experience that purpose not just as mattering to them, but as mattering in its own right. Because um, if it just matters to them, they could simultaneously think, well, it matters to me because I'm really caught up in it, but it doesn't really matter. And so I'm wasting my life. I'm so caught up in this thing. And yet I look back on this week and this year, and I'm like, what am I doing with my life, right? So to be able to get a grip on that kind of thing, I added the third condition, which is that it needs to be something that matters to them. Existential nihilists are an interesting case, right? Because I think existential nihilists could very much lead a purposeful life, and they could find things that matter to them, but, but in virtue of being existential nihilists, they almost have to think they don't matter in their own right, in, in which case they wouldn't count as counterexamples, I don't think. Anyway, I... We can carry this on more because I, I, I did not mean to be saying what I think it might, maybe I came across as saying. So thank you for asking the question. All right, do you want first to, me to say something in evidence of the claim that we're losing seminaries? Okay. Um, so why are we losing seminaries? I think think is largely, but surely not only due to um, the fact that many seminaries were bound up with denominations that are themselves declining, but it's also the case that um, residential ministerial preparation um, has become a tougher sell. Um, recruitment at those schools, student numbers are very often down. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on this, but what I do know is that there are, the seminaries are closing, and those were one of the places that were often institutional homes for people trying to do theology. Um, not all seminaries, by the way. Like, there's been an emergence of certain kinds of seminaries that have exploded in growth. Um, I can talk about those too, but um, anyway, the, the, what's really in some ways, what's really behind me thinking about the institutional homes for theology is two things. One, worrying about where our graduates are going to do this kind of work a lot. And two, I had a conversation with some much senior folks in the field several years ago, um, and they were they were worrying about the fact that there was a run of um, examples where the same people were going up for all of the jobs. And all of, not all of the jobs, but all of the jobs at these universities. And part of the reason for that was because there just weren't that many places that were training people in such a way that they would be recognizable to a university as doing the kind of thing that belongs in a university, right? Um, and that's sort of stuck with me. And I, I mean, if I'm being honest, when I came here, I sort of got a free pass, right? Nobody questioned whether I belonged here. 
People right away just sort of treated me like I was smart and I belonged here. And so I could sort of figure out my way. But it became, it got laid on my heart that I needed to lay out some account of what it would mean to do theology in a context like this so that it would be hopefully easier for people to understand how to carry on a path that includes theology in a university. Because there are places like Yale and Duke and Harvard and UVA and Vanderbilt. Like, there are places, there are still really good institutional homes for theology, and I sort of want to fight for them. Um, and so I've tried to make explicit how theology makes sense at this university as part of the effort to say, hey, theology can be part of a university. So I, I, I'm i happy to uh, hear more from you. You know a lot about institutions, so. Another aspect of this question is is that the crisis of, let's call it theology, is, is, is a lot part of a larger crisis of the humanities, right? And there are a lot of people asking some hard questions. And, and to conceive of a university the way it's, it's operated the last 40, 50 years, you know, I just think back, for example, the 18th century, no self-respecting gentleman would send his son to Oxford or Cambridge. They went to the Grand Tour, and so on and so on. In, in Russian Orthodox tradition, uh, no clergy were, were educated in seminary. They were educated in monasteries. So, so both kind of theologically, but also uh, you look at the history of education and how it's worked. There have been many different sites. And, and so uh, trying to uh, rev up a site that is maybe collapsing for good and bad reasons, cost, uh, uh, the capture of the one percenters, all, so on and so on. So what are, both for theology and maybe for the university in general, for learning in general, you know, what are alternative sites? Yeah, that's a nice question. So um, I do, I, I didn't make this clear what I should have, which is that I don't think at all that theology's only institutional home is a university like this one, right? I'm fighting for this context, but I want to fight for a lot of contexts. And I, I think that a lot of what we see we see a lot of responses on behalf of the humanities. Um, and one of the responses is that the humanities increasingly is, are, are increasingly trying to make sure that it's, it, that it's clear what we contribute to greater human goods. Um, and that's something that I'm invested in, but our school, like the Marty Center, is, is largely devoted to trying to figure that out and a lot of our students are trying to figure that out, and I want us to be resourcing that as well. And and I, yeah, so just because I'm fighting for this kind of theology shouldn't be taken to mean that I'm against any other kind of theology that I'd be fighting for. And truthfully, I think the mode that I'm talking about um, lends itself pretty well to some of those other modes. But anyway, that, that's, a, that's a good provocative question. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I could come back to um, Professor Rosengarten's comment about uh, modes of discourse uh, at the university, because it got me thinking um, about the structure of the of the lecture and the role you assign to the theological virtues. So when you dis first started talking about the nature of faith, I, you know, it sort of um, it reminded me that in your di in 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 the first half of the talk when you um, we're discussing epistemic virtues. If, unless I'm mistaken, there were three of them. There was truth, there was understanding, and there was wisdom. And the focus was on understanding and wisdom as opposed to truth, right? And then, then when we turn to the theological virtues, I think, I, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, the sense I got is that the, the model of theology that's on offer here um, the one you espouse, is essentially a version of theology as a self-understanding of faith. And yet I had wondered if there isn't something about the mode of theology as a discourse or the various discourses that are housed in theology, theology as a discursive practice, that actually makes it sit uneasily within the university. That's always one of the things that made it interesting for me, right? And, and you know, I think about, so I, so I guess the question, if, my question has to do with um, whether or not you would agree, first of all, but more specifically, it has to do with the comments you made about 
the the Chicago tradition and the role that correlation might play in that tradition. Since it seems to me that in the case of Tillich, in the case of um, Tracy, different kinds of correlational thinkers, um, but also in the case more recently of Marion's work on revelation, Marion, who in his early work looks like a non-correlationalist, right? Very much looks like there's a, there's a split. There's a, and, and that reason only leads us to idolatry. It turns out in the end, right? In the, in, in the mo more recent work on revelation, that he thinks of revelation as rationality par excellence. Right, so I'm wondering where you stand on this. Where would we map you on this very issue? Um, and do you have a sense that there is some way, there are ways in which theology as a discourse sits uneasily in the university? Uh, great question, thank you. Um, so first, a clarification. I was trying to suggest that in terms of the aims of the broader conversation, um, not that truth and knowledge drop off, but that truth and knowledge need to be subsumed under or part of understanding because just having true beliefs or even just knowing a certain belief is true isn't enough, right? We're, we're aiming for something higher, right? Something more estimable, namely understanding. Um, so I'm not suggesting that truth drops away. But that doesn't really address your bigger question. Um, which is, I mean, one way to put it is the sitting uneasily, and the other is to ask where I fit. You're right that by and large, um, I am, what I'm up to is uh, trying to make sense of uh, religion's self-understanding. Um, and doing that in such a way that I can uh, look to religions, especially Christianity, but not only, um, as a source of wisdom and putting that into conversation with broader wisdom traditions. Um, and in that sense, what I do, I don't know how easily it sits with the university, right? As soon as you say Christianity, people get nervous. Um, you thought your experience? Um, but that's distinct from, there's a mode of theology that is principally about truth, and that is principally about adjudicating uh, what is the correct belief about the doctrine of the Trinity, um, or what is the correct belief about any number of other things. And, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm obviously not just setting those kinds of issues aside, but that's not, that's not primarily what I'm after. Um, and so if somebody were to want, if somebody were to do that kind of work, I think that too can fit within a university, but it's it's just very different from the kind of stuff that I'm doing, um, and would require maybe a different account of how it fits in the university. Thanks for a really fascinating talk. Um, I really appreciate the um, implicit pluralism of the way in which you're talking about the discourse of theology. And I guess one of the things that I love about the Divinity School and one of the things that makes me proudest to be a part of a religion program is that I think that in theology, but also in a lot of what we do here that does not fall within theology, we are actually very clear and self-conscious about the sources of our norms and the way in which tradition factors into the act of thinking of all sorts. Um, and it sounds to me like that's part of what you're interested in here, and I sympathize with that. But the question that I always come back to, especially when, we, when we're thinking about theology as the discipline and the place in which one does that, is that if it's replicable, which I'm not saying it isn't, but I don't. here's where history really is important. What do we do about the fact that insofar as it becomes re replicable, it's so already infused by the hegemony that the role that Christianity has played in the university, in the history of the university, whether it's recognized or not, whether it feels marginalized or not now, but such that it can't help but then reshape in its own image those traditions that want to participate in an analogous mode of thinking. Yeah, this is a good question, and it's something that I have pushed pretty hard against, the idea that theology is essentially Christian, um, partly because partly because there are 
non-Christian theologians. And saying that theology is essentially Christian is to marginalize them and make it even harder for them to do the kind of thing that they're already usually experiencing as a hard thing to do. Um, and so um, over the last several years when I would teach intro to theology, we would have Anantan on Ramachan, uh, who is doing what he characterizes as Indian theology. Um, and we would have Stephen Batchelor, who eventually comes around to talking about doing Buddhist theology. Um, and we'd read Buzzy Fishbane, who's, he's, he's doing something more theological than any of us, if in my way of saying it. Um, and I want to insist on the one hand that what they are doing is theology, and it needs to be recognized as such, partly as a way of saying that, no, theology is not essentially Christian. We need to recognize the integrity of what they're doing and learn from it. I'll take help wherever I can get it. Um, on the other hand, does there also need to be a reckoning with the fact that the way there's a kind of momentum, historical momentum, from the fact that historically theology has been Christian, and therefore, even talking about something like theology is faith-seeking understanding. Oh, okay. Like, cool. That's a very Christian way to think about theology. Or understandability, right, might fit ill with, or where we look if we want to see our religion's self-representations, right? Um, like, Islamic theology is very often done under the guise of a kind of legal interpretation, right? Um, so I, I think we need to, if we want, if we want the field to be open to that, we need to, for lack of a better word, put our thumb on the scale in favor of some of these people who are trying to rethink what theology looks like so that it is something that fits with the kind of thing that people in those traditions would recognize as representing them and thinking with those traditions. Um, and truthfully, some of those are going to be harder than others. So if we want to get down to brass tacks, some religious traditions, including some Christian traditions, are not going to recognize as theology something that is not expressly devotional. And so if it is not expressed devotionally, it's not theology. Where if you're in a more liberal Christian tradition, like, oh, sure, we can separate those things out. But that's not always possible, right? This is one of the things that theology needs to reckon with if it's going to think about how other traditions could be included within the discipline. Again, though, that, that applies very often to Christians. And frankly, this is part of why a lot of students really loved Buzzy Fishbane's Sacred Attunement, because it's such a devotional book at the same time that it's a theology book. Um, so all that to say, like, I, I, I think you're exactly right that um, we need to, for the sake of the field generally, but for the sake of the field here, we need to be thinking about um, the ways in which these constraints could be opened up in such a way that they would welcome other kinds of theology. I think that's always going to be a, a, an issue. Thank you. Sir. Um, you talked about the aims of this type of presentation at the beginning, one of them being an overview of your work. To the degree that that overview of your work is intended to entice people to want to read more of your work and talk to you more, it worked. Um, <laughs> but a question. Uh, in your presentation, you were talking about the life well lived and a particular condition or yep. way of thinking about this where you're guided by a sense of purpose. And that purpose has to do with a couple of different types of meaning, meaning to you, or excuse me, mattering. Yeah. Mattering to you and mattering, mattering. Yeah. Um, my question is about what happens when people experience various kinds of mental health challenges, maybe particularly depression, where mattering isn't in their life anymore, maybe at all, or maybe it comes and goes, or it's greatly diminished. 
And so I was wondering if you were planning to attend to that either through the conversation about memoir. It sounded like maybe some of the memoirists maybe had talked, I don't know, um, or whether the virtues that you examine have something to say about getting mattering back. And if they don't, then is this life well lived just not possible for people that don't have access to mattering? Um, I mean, one thing to say is that this com this component of a life well lived wouldn't be open to people. That that would be the sum total of the implication. But even having said that, um, I mean, this part of what's interesting to me is that. Um, just to take one instance, hope against hope is a really interesting and important concept. Um, and some of the, I've read a lot more memoirs than just the ones that I've mentioned, right? And uh, some of them, they they do talk pretty extensively about depression. Um, and they can, and it's often the case that people will be able to find resources within the tradition of other people who've been in this kind of wilderness um, in such a way that they can they can feel like they can hold on and hold it together even when they can't hold on and hold it together, right? Like there's this hope against hope, believe in spite of my unbelief, like there's this this way in which there's a almost a, 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 a um, these oppositions can both be taken up into faith, hope, and love. And that's part of, again, like if, if, if this account needs is to be adequate to lived experience, then it needs to be able to look into that and also face squarely what the limitations of this kind of approach would be, right? Like it might not have answers for all of these issues. I appreciate the question. Thank you. Oh, I think hey, another difference about an inaugural lecture is that we make you work very hard. This uh, is great. You all are really smart. Plus, you get food at the end. You get a oh, and we get food. Yeah. Uh, so please join us downstairs in the comedy room and join me in that thing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.